you're listening to it came from the radio, you know this is Dr. Feldy, a.k.a. L. Man, a.k.a. Jennifer Elise Feldman. I'm here with Kevin McLaughlin. He is a producer, director, writer. He does many things. And he just produced a documentary film called Riot, One City's 50-Year Struggle to Leave Behind Its Worst Week Ever. This documentary is set to go nationwide on public TV in the upcoming months. Simply, Riot is about the 1967 riots in Newark that lasted for five days, consisting of bloody fighting, killed 26 people, and million dollars of damage. Now, it's 2024, as most of us know. Why produce a film about 1967? Well, thank you for asking that. The, there's a, uh, the very good reason is that, unfortunately, we haven't really learned our lessons from 50, 60 years ago and these kind of conflicts are still taking place. So my hope was to do a number of things, including get people to think as we move forward about how these kinds of conflicts can be avoided and also to learn from what happened there. It's a, it's a story of not just of those five days, but mm -hmm. of the all the years that followed and all the ways that the city and its surroundings were changed by what happened that week. Right which I have to watch it to find out all the nuance from you. So I'm looking forward to getting educated. I've only seen the trailer. It's coming out soon, 2025, right? Right, that's the plan. Um, right. It's going to be distributed through NETA, which is the National Educational Telecommunications Association. Mm -hmm. and They make it available to all the member public TV stations around the country. Um, and we have to convince them to run it. You know, that's gotcha. the, you know, they'll, they'll run it in the Newark area and uh, hopefully it will be seen all around the country. Um, right. The big hurdle between now and there is that I've got to raise some money from sponsors. Which we're going to get to at the end. Yes. yes. I want to get more into the meat and potatoes of what you actually did. And then we can talk about the sponsors, which I'm curious about as well. So now this all happened in 1967. A lot of people from the 90s, even people born in the 90s have passed. So there's not that many people left. Now, how did you select people to obtain information from? Um, because, you know, many people who are actually there at this rebellion or riot, which who knows what we should call it, really. Um, it, it must be difficult to find people who are actually there. So who was actually willing to share information and what kind of information did they divulge? Well, it's you know, one of the reasons I was drawn to this is because it's, you know, I kind of grew up in the shadow of it in the in the aftermath in, in Newark. And my dad was a fireman in the city, so he was directly involved and knew a lot of other people who could talk about it. So that was my entree to the topic. And I had been kicking around this idea for a couple of years and was uh, having a drink with my dad and a couple of his friends who were retired firemen. And I mentioned this and one of them said something that really stuck with me. He said, well, if you're going to do it, you better do it soon because right. these people are dying. Exactly. And, yeah. Uh, so that got me motivated to get going. And there, uh, I went through my dad and the retired police and firearms association to get the first responders response and uh, politicians, sociologists, historians, mm -hmm. You know, and gathered them bit by bit. The hardest part was just finding norm, norm, ordinary citizens who had lived through it, because mm. there's no association for those people. But right. a lot of digging and just word of mouth, I, I managed to contact uh, quite a few interesting people who had interesting stories about what happened back then. You know, if the people back then were checking in on Facebook and geotagging their photos you'd be able to find them quite easily. So right. I'm sure that anyone making a documentary on the riots now or rebellions, uh, next question, will not have such a difficult time. We could probably just go through public records to see where they were. Right. There, were, there is surprisingly little material from that on the scene because, of mm -hmm. course, nobody had a video camera. Most people there you know, didn't even have a still camera or mm -hmm. would even think of shooting pictures of that. Um, and even the news stations had a minimal ability to cover it. Um, I discovered uh, in oh. research this, going through news footage, that in those days, most of the TV news photographers were actually still photographers, and they didn't really know how to shoot oh. moving pictures. So you have That's a lot of very, very short clips, like they would roll three seconds of film and stop. 
Right. And I think they just the, take a photo. They were sent out with one roll of film for the whole day and they had to make oh, it last. So they would shoot yes, very yes. short things. Plus, very, back nice. in those days, there was all shot on film. And what they ran on the news in the evening was literally that film cut and edited to show. And so now, years later, that film is still all cut up. So I had to find pieces and try to string them back together. Right. Very interesting, which I'm sure you're capable of, you know, taping together or untaping and checking out the fine details on film <laughs> in a dark room with lots of dust. I'm sure you could do it if anyone could. Well, thank you. That was, you know, this part of the process was just uh, mostly came from ABC. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent weeks there just going through their archives, which are not as well organized as you might hope. And in fact, wow. between the time I selected footage and they gave it to me, they lost some of it. <laughs> oh, so those are what? things that are not in the film. Oh, but, wow. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the biggest expense that I need to cover now is to get ABC paid for providing that footage. Gotcha, gotcha. So before we go to that, I have two more questions about the content. Now, kind of going back, uh, you know, the film's about a series of events that happened in 1967, a long time ago. Now, just to make it super clear, why should anyone outside of Newark be interested? Why should anyone uh, on the other coast care what's going on, on the East Coast back then? Well, it's because, unfortunately, these kind of things happen all over the world really is mm -hmm. particularly in the United States. And um, somebody said to me that that idea that why should anybody outside Newark care about it? I, to me, that's like saying, why would anybody who doesn't live in outer space be interested in Star Wars? You know, it's right, a, right. <laughs> a story about people and conflict and resolution and uh, end of that conflict. So uh, it, it applies just as much today as it did 50 years ago. And it applies in every city in this country, uh, just as much as it does to Newark. So now, if the film is finished, which it seems like it is, and it's ready for distribution, uh, which is already kind of set on, on some level on public TV, and it's already in place, why do you need to find sponsors now? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm saying sponsors, although PBS doesn't really l let us call them sponsors. They're underwriters. Oh. It's the same thing, basically. But oh. the reason that uh, that happens is because in this kind of distribution, the producer gets absolutely zero from PBS. You get nothing. So your only mm -hmm. way to, to pay for things is to have backers sponsor, it, whether it's a corporation or a foundation or individuals. And... Uh, so there's a lot of those costs that need to be covered, like the news footage, the still photographs, the music. Plus, mm -hmm. I had a, a, quite a few people that worked on this for free with the assumption that someday they'll get paid, including me. I put 15 years in on this now and I haven't oh, wow. put a penny yet. 15 um, years you've been working on this? 14, actually. By the time we get to 2025, it'll be 15 years. Wow. You know, someone yesterday or two days ago who's not in filmmaking and business asked me how long it takes to make a film. And I said, well, I guess like one year is kind of fast, but it seems to be like a one to three year run for for nonfiction. But, you know, yes, for documentaries, I've heard it. I've heard this multiple times over 10, 14 years. Right. It takes a long time just to get you off the ground to begin with. But in a documentary like this, when there are specific people that you need to attract. For example, I, I started contacting mayors of Newark, whether there were, it was the current mayor at the time I was shooting, the current mayor was Cory Booker and getting through to a busy politician is always very tough. But then I went and tried to dig up people like previous mayors, like uh, Mayor Gibson, who was mayor, the next mayor after the riots happened. Mm. And He's a guy who's an older, older man and he didn't have an email address and nobody even knew where he lived. And it took a lot of digging to find him. But I didn't. Right. I was so glad I did because he was one of those people who was at that age where he's not afraid to say anything. <laughs> he didn't hold anything yeah. back. He told exactly oh. what he thought. And yes. he's one of about eight or nine people who are in the film who are now gone. So oh, I was wow. lucky to get them in while they were available. And your narrator also passed? That's right. Unfortunately, Andre Brower uh, passed uh, with a great shock to me at the huh. end of the past year. Um, he had lung cancer. Oh, uh, I... but he was a great asset to the film. 
in, in many ways, not just his phenomenal voice, but he was actually the first African, African American person to see the whole film and mm -hmm. offer some feedback, you know, some biases that I had that I, I wasn't even really aware of. So he was a great uh, asset to the, to the movie. Now, I'd like to know how to become a sponsor, but one question before that. Now, according to the film website, riotthefilm.com, the producers of Riot decided to let all sides have their say and let viewers decide what they believe instead of choosing sides. So, you know, between me and you, let's be real. You know, this is a, a private one-on-one -on -one here. Just kidding. Did you find yourself being pulled between conflicting points of view while producing or ping-ponging, like kind of going on one side and then flipping to another? Or how did that go? No, I think it was easy for me to understand how uh, different people had their different point of view. And for the most part, it was, you know, the white people had one point of view and the black people had another. Interesting. But even beyond that, one of the National Guardsmen pointed out some really interesting things. Craig Mirop was a, a, Craig, a National Guardsman who had some incredible stories. And, you know, he, he said people asked him, you know, how, how come you have all these stories and other people don't? Well, he just happened to be... Mm. Standing on the right corner at the time when something happened, you could you could see a big fire or a murder or something on one corner, two blocks away, you wouldn't know about it. So it kind of depends on who you find that happens to see it from that their point of view. He said he right. just happens to be that guy who's next in line when the bank gets robbed. You know that his whole life has been like that. So he, I was lucky to find him too as someone who not only witnessed things but remembers them in detail. Yeah, I really want to get educated because before this, checked your website. I scoured YouTube a bit because I wasn't alive in 1967. I was born in 84. So where am I going to get information? And there wasn't, there's, there's some online, but it seems like based on what you've said in your website, we're going to get a probably more nuanced look from you. So I really look forward to seeing your film Riot. Now, speaking of your film Riot, we have the whole time. What can I do if I want to become a sponsor? Well, you can go to the website, riotthefilm.com. Okay. And there's a, a sponsorship page with two sections, one for uh, corporations or um, larger scale sponsors who could who could be the ones with that 15 second announcement at the beginning and the end, or just mm -hmm. an individual who wants to give five, ten, a hundred dollars you can get a tax deduction for that because we have a fiscal sponsorship through the film collaborative. So it counts as a charitable donation. So I'm hoping people will go there and uh, in the next few days, I hope we're going to have a spot running on cable TV in the general area, uh, telling people about this and directing them to that website. So this wasn't on my questions list, but riot or rebellion, what's the difference? How do you see this? Is That's, it both? That is a segment in the film where we discuss that controversy, one of many, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. where people choose to call these kind of events by different names. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a, a feeling in the black activist community that calling it a riot kind of denigrates it and, and doesn't appreciate the, the angst behind it and the, the mm -hmm. legitimate reasons for protest that started it. Uh, I can appreciate that, but I also know that in my whole life, I have only ever heard people call it a riot. I mm -hmm. never heard that term rebellion until I started working on this film. Uh, and then we have one of the uh, great contributors to the film is Dr. Clement Price. He was the official historian of Newark who puts it very in, in an interesting way, saying that the people in America think of the uh, Boston Tea Party as this great rise of discontent against the crown, but people in England mm -hmm. saw it as a riot. So ah, uh -huh. it's all a matter of perspective, and I try to allow all perspectives in the film. So we call the we call we call it the film riot because that's what people understand. And rebellion is discussed, and you get people in the film explaining why they prefer to call it that. Hmm. Do you think that news channels that covered this event were as I guess fair and unbiased as your documentary? No, not at all, because back then it was a whole different uh, ball of wax in the, the social fabric of our country. You know, there there was really, really very little respect for people protesting, very little understanding wow. of their problems and issues. So that was pretty one sided on the favor of the police.
Now, you can see the trailer at riotthefilm.com. Where can listeners find out more about you, your other projects? Because you're not just a documentarian. You are a filmmaker. You're a producer. You do nonfiction. I believe you do commercials as well. We met at a film festival as quite artsy and not exactly nonfiction. So give us your website and socials. Where can people find you? Um, on Facebook under my name. Okay. Uh, that's my only social media use. Uh, the, the website here is riotthefilm.com, as you said. I also have another site called uh, renaissanceprods.com. It's renaissanceprods.com, where there's a more general look at the different kinds of things I'm doing. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Kevin McLaughlin. And uh, if you want to spell that to find him on Facebook, it's Kevin, K-E-V-I-N, M-C-L-A-G-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. Like, like Loth. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin McLaughlin. Looking forward to see your film. And any final thoughts for listeners on It Came From the Radio? Uh, just thanks for having me. I hope that people will go to the website, check it out, keep an eye out for it. It's coming. It's going to be something that I hope opens a lot of minds and gets people thinking about how we relate to other people and how we uh, avoid conflict as we go through life. Avoiding conflict having solutions, Riot, the documentary, and now back to the studio, Mark Torres for more Came From the Radio.